Hi, my name is Mishra. At HashiCorp, we often get asked about service meshes. Service mesh technologies have gained a lot of interest over the past couple of years, even though the concept of a service mesh might not be new to people, but the implementation details are new to people. In this video, we will explore some concepts behind the service mesh. So let's get started. So here we have a service called service A. And we have another service called service B. And these can be a VM or a container. Uh, they, can be, they can be running in a bare metal server. It doesn't really matter. So how would service A talk to service B? They could just hard code the IP for service B in the config of service A, which is super, super easy. You can hard code the host name or the IP and just make an HTTP call and you're off to the races. But in reality, this is, this is not the case, right? You have multiple instances of services. So service B, service B, and all of these can be, can be used in terms of like receiving traffic on the other end. So we have this problem in which you, know, you have a dis service discovery problem. How does service A talk to service B? Uh, what instance of service B should service A talk to, right? So we have a problem for service discovery. Right. And also, one of the other things that we often ignore is this idea of, of you know, everything working fine in a data center on a network. A network is not usually reliable, so uh, a service A call to service B might fail, right? So should you retry, right? That's another question that you have to discover. So should there be retries? And is it even safe to retry? That's another question. Uh, certain calls, like a database write, may or may not be safe to retry. So those are the kind of challenges that you see in service-to-service -service communication as well. Now let's talk about security, and especially if you go, go into the, the whole cloud, uh, cloud native space or, or zero trust networks in which you don't have control over your own network, how do you go about encrypting traffic from service A to service B? So it's okay to be in your own kind of DMZ, uh, in your own network and, and you know, maybe use plain text for certain things that are not sensitive when it comes to service to service communication. Um, but in reality, we need some form, of, some form of encryption. You can use things like mutual TLS to, to kind of achieve this uh, service to service kind of encryption. And to do that, you, you have an identity problem. Each service needs to be given a unique identity. So let's say in this case, service A might get a certificate called service A. And in this case, this instance of service B might get a cert. Let's call it B1, service B1, right? So you have to distribute these certificates across different instances of, of services. They might be running uh, on a bare metal or a VM or a container. It doesn't matter. So you have this identity problem, right? So now let's take a case in which you, know, you have an established mutual TLS connection between service A and service B, right? So let's say this actually works. So let's say service A and service B had, had the right certificates. They're able to make the mutual TLS connection. They're able to successfully talk to each other uh, on the network. Um, but the question is, are they actually allowed to talk to each other? And that's where you have this problem of whether there's a policy involved here or whether they're allowed to talk to, talk to each other. So you might have a set of policies that define you know, in your business logic whether a service A or service B should be allowed to talk to each other, should a, you know, a user profile service be allowed to access the billing content and so on. So those are the type of things that you define in policies and you, you do need some form of authorization there. So you have the OTC problem. So these are some of the concerns when it comes to services service communication, uh, especially when you move into the world of microservices and especially if you're running these microservices on the cloud. So before we go any further, we'd like to kind of explore some of the first principles behind service-to-service -service communication. So we'll explore the first principles. So there are two things that I'd like to explore when it comes to the model which services take when they communicate with each other. One's the smart client approach. The other one is the smart network approach. 
or you could call it the smart mesh approach. So let's, let's explore the smart client approach. So in the smart client approach, let's say we have a service A and service B, very, very similar to our example before, and they're able to talk to each other. So all the smarts that comes with you know, service to service communication, this might be circuit breaking, retries, uh, traffic shaping, and things like that, they all built in the code base for app one, in this case, service one. So service one contains everything it needs to do the service call. So this might be achieved using a set of libraries. You might include a Java library or a Golang library based on what you use in your company and, and get that for free, basically, as part of the code. So overall, the system is actually very easy to reason about because everything that you're, you know, you're seeing over the network or uh, the, the type of calls you're making, they're all defined in code in your code base, which is fairly easy to kind of reason about of like the kind of the holistic sense of the system. Where it gets interesting is, let's say you were a polyglot organization. Uh, in those cases, let's say you're using JavaScript, you're using uh, Golang, you're using PHP. Uh, it becomes really interesting that you will need to, you'll need to kind of duplicate code in a way. You'll need to create the same set of libraries for each of those languages and then share them out in the organization. And let's say you have to update the libraries. It becomes more and more difficult because now those updates have to be applied across three or, three or four different languages. Uh, you need to coordinate between teams. Those are the kind of the challenges that you see in the smart client approach. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, companies that have come out and talked about it, uh, you know, one of the successful ones, uh, Netflix has you know, talked about it uh, pretty frequently that they, they've used libraries like Hystrix, Ribbon, and Eureka to kind of achieve the service to service communication. And these are the libraries that they share in the organization, and, and developers include them and get this smart uh, in, into the application. Right? So now let's explore like, the smart network or the service mesh. Right? So in this case, let's say you have the same example you have service A and you have service B. So you basically introduce another process, which is outside of the application process, which is the proxy, or the smart proxy. So this proxy is running alongside the application, uh, and it's running in a VM. Let's say, for example, in this case, you're running service A in a VM, and service B is running in Kubernetes in a Kubernetes pod. So this proxy is alongside the application in the VM and is a sidecar in the Kubernetes pod. Right? Super easy. This proxy, this process, actually has all the smarts built in. So you offload all those responsibilities uh, to this proxy, and this proxy is, is the kind of the, the prime motive for this proxy, is to make the service-to-service -service communication easy, do traffic shaping for you, uh, do authorization, generate certificates, and so on. Right? So in this case, the way the service calls happen is that service A talks to this proxy on a local port, which is completely secure. It's in the same VM. Uh, this proxy forward the request and does like some form of service discovery to figure out where this instance of service B is running, in this case, Kubernetes, and then forward that call up to service B. Right? So this is how kind of the, the flow of requests happens. So service A to the local proxy, to the proxy uh, on, on Kubernetes, uh, and down again, lo local host onto service B. So in this approach, what's interesting is there's no logic that you need, or there's little to no code changes that are required in the service A code or service B code all that code and all that smarts is built into the proxy instead, right? Which is a huge advantage over the other approach in which you had to ship these libraries across your organization, maintain the versions, you know, update the libraries and so on, which would cause, cause kind of chaos in your organization because you had to coordinate these changes uh, across many different groups. But in terms of complexity and thinking about, you know, reasoning about the whole network, now you have this, you know, this, this yet another process that you have to account for when you holistically think about the system uh, you know, your application owners, you know, might see an error over the network. They think it's with the application, but it might be the, the proxy that's, that's kind of causing those issues and so on. So those are the kind of questions or those are the kind of concerns when it comes to, you know, the, the service mesh. And service mesh kind of, you know, uses some form of telemetry or do things like, uh, things like observability, which in, it kind of, kind of addresses those, those failures when it comes to, you know, seeing errors in production and kind of going about debugging them and so on. So those are kind of the pros and cons of using, uh, using a service mesh or smart network. So let's kind of dive deep into, into the service mesh architecture itself. So in terms of kind of the, 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 the big parts that, that the service mesh brings in, there's two parts. There's, there's the control plane, there's the data plane. So this proxy requires some form of data to configure itself. Uh, and that, that's been provided using a config file 
are over the API. So a lot of proxies like Envoy, they expose an API that you can kind of use and configure them in runtime. The other proxies uh, like Nginx, you can kind of provide them a file um, and that they can read and they can reload the, the process and you're off to the races. So those are the type of things that you do to kind of you know, configure the proxy. And this part here is basically responsibility of the control plane. So the control plane is responsible for configuring and providing that service discovery data. It's also responsible for you know, managing authorization. Uh, it's responsible for storing the, the routes when it comes to what service we should be talking to, what service, and so on. And that's all kind of responsibility of the control plane, where the proxy itself is the data plane. And its responsibility is to do the heavy lifting, which is to actually route packets. It's responsible for doing things like enforcing retries, enforcing circuit breaking, uh, making sure you know, it's able to generate certificates and, and use them uh, to kind of do that mutual TLS connection between the services. So that summarizes the control plate side of things and the data plate side of things, which kind of make up this really interesting service mesh system. So when we talk about HashiCorp console, the console servers make up the control plane and the console clients make up the data plane. The clients are able to you know, give you a sidecar using Envoy. Or you can even configure other proxies to work with uh, work with console's data plane. So that kind of gives you a summary of you know, the service mesh, how it applies to console, how it maps there, and all the other options that you have with smart client, uh, you know, smart networking, and so on. So that's the first set of principles when we talk about the first principles for service-to-service -service communication. So the second set of principles is the protocol awareness. So this might be you're using a layer four data plane versus a layer seven data plane. So when I talk about data plane, it's the actual proxy that's responsible for routing the packets, right? So with layer four, you have protocols like UDP or TCP. With layer seven, you might see protocols like HTTP that are more popular, right? So with UDP, TCP, you can do things like you can do like database calls and, and so on. And those work fine, no problem. They have insane amount of performance when it comes to uh, service-to-service -service communication or service-to-database communication over the data proxy, which is super, super interesting. Uh, on the HTTP side, you get this really rich insight into, into a request. So you can do more complicated actions on the service query. So you can do like traffic shaping based on a host header, or you can do traffic shaping based on a, based on a domain name and so on. And that gives kind of the, the part to the developers to do things like you know, split testing and, and do cookie-based routing and so on. And it's really useful for doing service-to-service -service communication in the modern world. And both of these have pros and cons, of course. The pros being, you know, in, the, in the layer seven case, you can do more complex actions. In layer four, you're not inspecting the packet. So you kind of, you can't, you kind of can't do like much complex type of communication. Um, but performance spaces, layer four might be more performant than layer seven. I hope you learned more about service meshes in this video. To learn more about the concepts behind service mesh, go to our learn platform.